Thanks. Welcome, everyone. I'm Zach Semke. I'm director of Pass Fast Accelerator, and really happy that you're all here for today's program of construction tech. We'll be joined by Cliff Chambers and Luis Garcia about and learning about Site Super Insights. So the Passive House Accelerator is a collaborative online platform for sharing innovation and thought leadership in passive house design and construction. We publish articles and interviews, produce weekly virtual confabs with passive house pioneers from around the world, and elevate the work and programming of the passive house movement's leaders, practitioners, and organizations through interviews, articles, social media campaigns, video, and podcasts. Our aim is to catalyze zero carbon building by accelerating the adoption of passive house building. With our co-hosts, Kevin Brennan, Sean St. Amour, and Mark Willey, we have launched Construction Tech Tuesday to share the technical, the technique, and the technology of Passive House Construction Tech. And tonight we're joined by co-host Shannon Pendleton of Sanderd Sanderson Design. Um, she'll be guest co-hosting tonight, filling in for Mark Willey, I believe. Each week we'll welcome guest practitioners to dive into the details of practice with the builder and tradesperson as our target audience. We welcome folks from all corners of the construction and design world to join us each week. And this week, we wanna give a special shot, a shout out, excuse me, to our sponsor of the week, 475 High Performance Building Supply. So all of our programs this week are, are made possible thanks to our sponsor of the week. And with that, I'll hand it off to the co-host. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Sean Sainamore with, uh, from 475. So happy to be the sponsor um, this week. Uh, I'm actually, uh, if you missed it in the, in the pre-show, I'm up in Winset, which is just north of Smithers, BC, where we're teaching the local community how to create and uh, build their own multifamily passive house. So thank you for joining us, and I'll turn it over to uh, Shannon. I'm excited to be here tonight, really looking forward to the presentation, and uh, Really excited to take Mark's shoes tonight instead of yours. Uh, I'm glad you had a good birthday last week. And I know Mark is on the road. He's, he's earning his bacon, <laughs> exactly. And uh, I'm coming from New Hope today, which is just between New York and Philadelphia. And I'll send it over to Kevin. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, thanks for filling in for Mark and Sean. It's uh, great to have you. Your lively comment and, and uh, comments are always welcome, and uh, please share your insight at will. Uh, but I would like to say that uh, our two co our two additional co-hosts this evening, uh, Cliff and Luis, are filling in on a, at Mark's beard at the next level. They, we have upgraded our beards on this show. I promise you that. Um, uh, it's 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 high quality. Mark's is you know it's it's quality. It's long. It's great. You know, but you know well-trimmed dapper guys and uh they not only take pride in their beards but they also take pride in their craftsmanship and the skills and the projects that they work on so uh i've had the lovely pleasure of working with cliff uh on on our first project you know i don't even know what, what year that was that was two, 2013 maybe or so you know it was early days of passive house what was it cliff Started in 2012 because I remember Sandy, and we finished 2000 late 2013, early 2014. Yes, it was, it was, it was the early days of Passive House. You know, like 475 was getting off the ground. They were starting dis distribution of their products to make Passive House easier. Um, uh, this was one of the early adapters. You know, the fax thing was like, yeah, I think we can do this. You know, it's a great story. And uh, the, 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 the team at Tafara. They jumped at it. It's a beautiful project. It's it's lead 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 gold, I believe, certified. Um, uh, it had passive house aspirations for certification. It was like right there. Um, uh, the blower door test at the end, we had trouble with a little. It's lead platinum, as Mike just pointed out in the uh, in the uh, in, in the chat there. But uh, from that project, we've grown as a community from that first project that we put together, and we've had a lot of lessons learned, a lot of things to share. Um, uh, it's helped me as a trainer being involved in a project like that to teach the Pass Trades Tradesperson course because literally I saw the pains of the construction team going through of like what happens when you don't when you don't really like find those the fine details and things don't like mesh well. So it was great lessons learned, but the project was great to learn. And then you fast forward a few years and Cliff uh, took my class, which is the Pass Trades Tradesperson course I give I gave in uh, in. 
at the Association for Energy Affordability in partnership with the Passive House Academy. It was a great class. Cliff had a bunch of great students in the class. I got a class photo to show a little later. And then we had the lovely pleasure of uh, going back and forth on one on the, the project in Brooklyn Heights. And uh, that project was a great success. And Cliff had a full deck of cards he was working with and, and, and process and experience of working in Passive House. So um, uh, we'll, we'll talk to Cliff. And then we also have Luis on the show. Luis is a uh, project manager and site super for uh, SRM Craftworks. And craftsmanship is in the name of the, of, their, of, their, of, their, of the actual general contractor, but you go to their projects and you see the craftsmanship that is, that is, uh, that's coming through. And I had the lovely pleasure of meeting Luis during the, uh, the first Tech Tuesday. They were there doing their blow a door testing, uh, early stages blow a door testing as we were filming the Skylight first Tech Tuesday videos uh, with Mike and uh, and everyone from the SRM Craftwork. So I'm gonna introduce you guys. We're gonna first go with Cliff. Uh, we're first gonna go with Luis, and he's gonna introduce what it's like to be a passive house site super and and a project manager and what it's like to deliver that. So uh, thank you, and I'll kick it off to you, Luis. Well, thanks, Kevin. Um, I'd like to start. I'd like to um, start by saying it's a pleasure to be here. Before I start, I would like to share a few things about myself. I originally wanted to be an architect, and but while pursuing my bachelor, I um, started working as a in the construction field, and I found a passion with um, bringing drawings to reality. So I instead chose that route. I've been working now in construction for five years, and I am currently working on my first passive house project. Um, most of the time I've been in construction, I've been with SMR Craftworks. And um, with that being said, I would like to move on and show some pictures of the project we are currently working on and um, talk about um, some of the um, materials we use and methods versus, and why we chose to use those materials and method versus um, a different method you know well you, while you're sharing your screen maybe you can answer a quick question what uh what what architecture school did you go to while i went to new york institute of technology nyit nice NYIT, yes i know an architecture firm that recruits from there heavily it was um it was fun fun experience there and that, that was the, new, the the brooklyn campus or the long island campus i went to the manhattan campus actually they also have and it's in Manhattan. So that's where I, I went to both the Long Island and Manhattan. Nice. All right, so tell us what you got here. This picture here is uh, at the roof at 37 Sydney Place. Um, we chose to do Intello here instead of plywood. Uh, reason being that um, you would be able to see how much insulation um, goes into it. So uh, that was one of the main reasons why we chose to go with it. And it's, it's uh, you know, at least for me, an easy, easy material to, to handle. As you can see here, we have our Intello membrane all over the place. And then we have um, the Vana tape, taping together all those seams, um, both products from 475. The next picture is it's, it's showing the same and it's showing that skylight that um, Kevin touched based on earlier um, on the show. So that's, that, was, that was part of this project. And um, that there's another skylight there. This house has an overall of five skylights up in that roof. So yeah, that's the um, big window that Kevin was talking about earlier, the big skylight. Moving on. Triple pane piece of thermally broken engineering from Europe, from Lamalux. And it does its job of letting in the light, right? It, it take, totally transforms that, that whole space, right? It, it sure does. You go up there during the um, the day when the sun is out and you do not need any type of artificial light up there. There's no need for any light at all. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful space. I also found it interesting from an architecture point of view how that how that room you're now able to, to, to stand in there and took, it made it like, you know, a useful space. Well, yeah, it's made it where you could actually walk underneath the skylight. So there's a good amount of walkable space there. So that, that was a plus within within that space and the use of that skylight. Um, so the, the third picture I'm showing is how we um, go about doing our passive details before we actually do our structural work. So what you see are the black there, that's uh, the Viscon. And we um, would put that before we, um, you know, put it, put, put in that C channel. 
And an issue we encountered there was while we um, prepped everything, which we thought was good, we, then came the steel guy. He came to install the steel beam and the steel beam wasn't sitting flat on that surface. So he had to take it out. He had to um, make sure prep the error properly again, which, which consisted of, you know, um, regrouting, chipping away, regrouting, and then putting more risk on again. So you know, after that hiccup, we learned from there how to properly um, deal with, with um, the installation of these beams. And this, this picture here is showing, you know, we had the, um, we could have used Viscon or Intello since the, that wall there is a party wall. So we had the option of, of um, either going with the Viscon and Intello. Um, we tried the Intello at first, but um, during this stage of the project with heavy demo, um, there was a lot of debris, um, a lot of heavy demo happening. So, you know, it started to rip away at the Intello and um, it just it was not working out with all the subs there doing demo. And so we, um, after this, moving forward, we ended up just using the, uh, the Viscon. That's great. A little bit of trial and error. That's how these projects happen. Absolutely. And again, more pictures of just showing um, the first beam there. Uh, you can see, I don't know if you can see, it's very difficult to see, but there's insulation in between the brick and the um, LVL, a passive detail, and it's just some prep work beforehand. It's typical window uh, detail We for a passive house. You know, we have our plywood box. Um, then you would, you see there is the, that yellow caulk that you see is a, a a stole product. It's a uh, from Rapid Seal, which we um, like using because it's it's thick. It comes in a caulk and a sausage, and um, it covers areas up to three quarters of an inch. So that's always a plus because you know you deal with a variety number of sizes of gaps. And you could also see the viscon there slightly. So that's us just making sure that that I would box is airtight to the barrier, and then your window will install. You know, you, you see all our tape from 475. We have our Contega tape there, the white tape. We have our flashing, typical way of doing a window install. Um, things that I've countered while working with site supers is um, one of the main things I did was every subcontractor that would come into the job site, I would make sure uh, first thing I told them was the type of project we were doing and what they can and cannot do. Like you can't go around, make holes anywhere, you know, at, at free will. You got to come to me and let me know first. Now, as we know, not all subcontractors sub adhere to that advice. So um, as the site super um, on this job, part of, part of my job was every day going, checking around the air barrier, checking around and just checking that we were still airtight um, at every point. Um, something that helped us tremendously while we were doing this process was um, having the blower door test early. Um, we had our first blower door test uh, once we had a few windows installed. Um, once we passed that, we knew we were good. Then we went on and had another test once all our windows and doors and barrier was, and vapor barrier slash air barrier was installed. And um, we passed that. So we are 99.9% .9 sure that uh, once we come to the final blow blower door test, yeah, we will be um, good, you know, that we will pass few people that have helped me throughout the process, this process, it being my first, is um, Andrew Fishman. He's the um, president of SMR. He actually took the course that Kevin, um, the, the, uh, Kevin teaches. So he's been the second eye on the project. He comes and, you know, uh, if not daily, uh, at least once or twice um, every so, he comes every so often and just, you know, he's the second set of eyes. And another person that has helped me tremendously is um, John Mitchell. He's from Building Type. He's the um, our consultant on the project, and he has been great with any questions we had. Um, he would answer them in a timely fashion. He was in the projects from the beginning, so he um, would you know call me and let me know like you know you need to watch out for this. He would come to the job site. 
make sh review it, make sure that everything was being done properly. And there was even a certain occasions where I had a question or anything and we would get on a FaceTime call and, you know, he'll help me through the issues. So it's overall, it's been a great experience and it's th thanks to those guys. And uh, moving forward, I mean, I, I would like to say that because of that and, you know, the main things that has helped this project move along is being on top of um, the blower door test and just making sure overall that all the details are as needed or as they need to be. Because, uh, I mean, working on the field, not everything could be done at, done at this drawn. I mean, that's just almost near impossible. There's always hiccups and there's always readjustment. And um, having the right team has helped me a lot. You know, having Bax, um, John from Building Type, they have helped me a lot throughout the process. So I want to thank them and thank, um, you know, everyone that's been, been a part of the project. It's been truly a, press, a pleasure. And cool. uh, yeah, that's, that's all I have. Well, thanks, Lee. Nice. We appreciate Great presentation, it. Lee. Very nice. Thank you so much. It was really fun to hear you talk about this tonight. And also last night, talking about your first class of house project and, and how it's going to set you up for a smooth delivery next time. It's it's great to share those lessons learned. We've got some questions that came in from the chat and Ingrid added to her question. Um, she wanted to know what influenced your choice, but then she had another question. Um, Ingrid, if you're there, can you unmute and, and ask your question to Louise? Sure. Um, it's, it's for both, but I understand that Clint is, is gonna present later. Um, what drew you to passive house design because I, I know what my interest is as a, as a home builder um, and here in Detroit don't see a lot of um, either retrofits using passive house design principles or um, uh, new builds so I know what, what drew me but what drew you to passive house design? Uh, for, me, for me personally the idea of having of minimizing the amount of energy you use it's it's a big plus, you know, uh, making a house that you don't even have to turn on your air conditioner or your heater during the summer, winter months. It, it's it's not only cost effective, but it's um, healthy to the planet. So those that's one of the main reasons why I, I like doing passive projects. When you say cost effective, I mean, like most of the stuff that I've seen, most of the projects are like seriously expensive, like it's not is not for single moms. <laughs> so what do you mean when you say cost effective? Well, what I mean is that in the long run, if you're going to live there, you will be saving um, money on your, in your bills. You know, that that's, that's what I mean. Thank you. Louise. Louise. I can help you. I, I, that one of the first projects was bid one way and they, the first time they bid it, it was regular construction. 13 tons of cooling and heating for uh, for a, a seven story brownstone. After it was done passive house, it was less than four, but it really only needed three. So they save a lot on the mechanicals and there was no boiler. I think the original design had a boiler. So when we're talking about these gut renovations of these luxury brownstones, it makes a little cost effective on that side. What you're not investing in a boiler and cooling, you're investing in the envelope. And you know how you finish it is how the clients want to finish it. You know, so that's just something to share there. Does that help, Ingrid? Uh, yeah, sure. I <laughs> never know when I'm allowed to speak or not, but uh, yeah, sure. Ingrid, I'd love to connect with you after the presentations uh, offline because I can show you some great examples of what I think you're looking for. Um, Kevin, do we want to continue with the questions? Or do, yeah, sound no. good. We'll we'll jump to Cliff here and uh, we'll okay. tell his story, and then we'll open it up to questions and keep that open conversation going. That makes this. Uh, the Tuesday, uh, you know, technical and welcoming, so. Hello everyone, good night or good evening, depending on where you're at. Um, a little bit about myself, I think I've been doing construction technically all my life, uh, getting paid for it for about 23 years now, um, managing projects for at least 15 of those. Um, uh, I love what I do, I think it's amazing. Um, just to see a project start from the beginning and see a transition to something completely different at the end, I think is just amazing for me. Um, every day is a new challenge. Uh, some days are good, some days are bad, mostly bad, but I enjoy it and I will love it. 
Um, I think the whole idea of pass the house is amazing. I believe we do need a good team, a strong team. I believe I couldn't done, have done any of the two projects without the Bax Ingrid team. Uh, it's just an amazing group of people over there, um, as well as Kevin. Um, and I will always push, I believe, if you're going to do a project, what's really important, um, I have like five items. I think just getting educating and teaching and understanding before you even start a project is extremely important. Um, if you're a client, an architect, or just trying to get an idea because you don't want to dive into it. And as Ingrid said, spend a ton of money and not know exactly what you're doing. So to get educated is extremely important. Um, you may not like what you're learning or may not fit for you, but it's really important that you get educated first because it's extremely uh, difficult and it's hard to pass on information to people who don't know. Um, so with that being said, my first project was 88th Street. Um, I did that with the Bax Ingrid team. Uh, Sohi and Mark, I believe, came, was the designer on the team as well. Um, we had Kevin. In the beginning, honestly, I did not have a clue of exactly what was being done. Um, cause I would think I'm building a conventional build, uh, midway through the project, I had a better understanding and I should have had the knowledge at the beginning of the project. Cause I believe that we could have resolved a lot of our issues in the beginning. Uh, we were able to hit our numbers. Um, and it was an amazing project, but it was really difficult. Um, as we had a discussion, discussion last night, uh, and this may sound kind of funny. I know I'm, I'm really dry at jokes, but I run a large daycare babysitting service for adults. So I have to teach <laughs> grown men who have been doing it for 20, 35 years on how to actually do everything completely different. And this is really hard. I think this is probably, I have to talk to my company. I need to get paid more money because I don't get paid <laughs> enough. Teach, it's almost like, you know, being at a, a psychiatrist and they don't want to change. Once they get the concept, they understand, then they're all on board. So my second project was so much easier because I knew I can control it, pick the subs that has the understanding. And it was so much a smooth transition on the second project. Even on the second one, it's still difficult because you're now trying to train or change people of the way of thinking and building. And that is always gonna be difficult, no matter how hard you try. Um, there was a lot of hiccups at the 88, but we did it and went through. My second project was at 105 Willow, which I believe went amazing and smooth because I really understood the products that I was using. Um, I understand testing. You need to test in the beginning, test in the middle, test at the end and keep your data. It's just constant testing to make sure. So if you're installing your windows, installing your, your, your doors, you test again, just to make sure that the numbers are not changing at all. Um, Cause it's really difficult to maintain and keep these numbers. Um, once you get all the products in, I believe it might be expensive, but I think you do save your money in the long haul, depending on if you're looking at this project, it's an investment, it's a long-term investment but it definitely works. And once you start building this way, you will continue to build. I, my own home, I don't install windows or doors the conventional way that I used to do it. I constantly do it the way I was taught at, at the passive house teaching class. I don't do it anymore. Uh, I try to eliminate as many holes penetrating out of a building. It's just something, once you get used to it, you're gonna always constantly do it. Um, it takes some time, but again, education and teaching and training We'll get you that point. Awesome, Cliff. You can't unsee what you learn on the site. And then when you take pride in what you do, it's tough to do it the wrong way. It's yeah, tough I mean, to let other people to do it the wrong way. If you, again, if you, once you initially start a project and you tell the guys, women, whoever's on board exactly what's being done and you either hold their hands or you force feed them. I normally take people in the back of the room and I beat, it, beat them in their head and say it has to get done this way or throw them up the building, it will get done. It takes a while, but 
uh, I don't know. I don't have any lawsuits yet, but I'm waiting for them to come, but it will get done. I know something that, uh, that, that we were doing on the, a few of the early after 88th street was we were having like an orientation, like a passive house orientation at the projects. And we would have the general contractor and all the, 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 the supers, all the, uh, subcontractors, the plumber, the electrician, the masons, anyone who was really doing work on the project. And I would just do a quick demo with a box and a fan and show mm -hmm. how, when you penetrate the air barrier, it needs to be sealed and how much work goes into sealing that, you know, uh, I know, I remember at 88th street, the, uh, the low voltage guy was like, these are fiber optic wires. They need to be fastened and they can't be punctured. If one of these get broken there, you have to find it and run the whole thing. And I'm like, dude, you're penetrating my air barrier a thousand times for no reason at all. <laughs> I'm like, I got to find those too. But, uh, it's, it's, it's training everyone, getting everyone on board, but given that mutual respect of everyone on the site, we kind of are changing the hierarchy of construction. You know, it's the guys with the busiest schedule got the most kind of like leeway or, 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 or respect, you know, the drywallers and the framers, they always had top billing. And now with passive house, we flip it around the, the air ceiling guy and the window installer and the HVAC guy get first dibs at square footage on the wall. And when it happens, and that's because you can't, you can't fake the blow a door. The blow a door is pass or fail. The owner wants a passive house. They're going to pay for a passive house. We need to pass the blow a door. We can make everything else work. So, and if you if you if you keep the same subcontractors from one job to the next, it you know I know it might be difficult. They get to understand that once they do it one time, they will continue to understand what needs to be done. When you're constantly switching subcontractors, it get a little bit difficult because they don't know exactly what they want to do and they fall back into the same mold of what I want to do, what I used to be doing for the past 20 odd years. I know it's great when I, when, cause I'm a subcontractor for Tafara. We're working on two other passive house projects in the neighborhood as well. And it's great to see the same electrician and the same plumber because we see each other and we, it's like, Oh, you know, all right, I'm going to give you gaskets and grommets. You're going to make the holes in the right spots. HVAC guy. All right. You're going to put the ERV in this spot. All right. Remember, we need to make sure we need space to tape behind it. Or do you want a grommet or a gasket to make it easier? Do we have enough space for insulation? You know, um, uh, and it's great to have those familiar faces. But when you get a new face, um, uh, it's easy when I'm there doing the work. But when you guys as subcontractors, like the two projects you guys, you guys worked on, like you, you're, you're filling in with John. So now you guys got to fill in as that teacher and trainer. Uh, Cliff, you were that trainer at 105. I think you hired AEA to do some of the uh, air sealing there after I left, right? Yeah, so I did most of the training and AEA came in and uh, finished up. But um, we, the, the electrician and the plumbing was the same subcontract truck, subcontract that we used at um, 88th Street. So they pretty much got the gist of exactly what needs to be done. Um, so yeah, the AEA finished up for us, yeah. And uh, for like, as far as you guys go for like, you guys run a, a unique operation and that both of you guys are site supers. So you get to supervise all the work that happens, but also your project managers. So you got to keep track of the schedule. Is there any advice you can give to people in the crowd about how you manage both um, uh, scheduling wise and sequencing air barriers and blow a door tests and things like that? Uh, little sleep on the weekend or little sleep throughout <laughs> the entire project. You're not going to get any sleep. It's going to be busy, busy, busy. So from, I know from working with Cliff, he has that first in last out leadership kind of thing. He's the first one in the project. He's the last one to leave, even though he's got other things pulling him, pulling him away at home. He just wants to make sure the next day is set up. And I think that is where the quality starts. And everyone that works under you as a subcontractor respects that. And they come to you and ask, can I work here? You know, whereas under other formats, you know, the, it would be very difficult for me as a subcontractor to come in and screw up your work because I would feel very guilty that I screwed up your schedule. Well, you know, I ruined your weekend because I made a bunch of holes or didn't respect the rules of the of the project. Mm -hmm. So I know uh, I know it's great to have you guys as the on site, and I, I've seen you guys work. You guys are working the project. You're walking around. You're from top to bottom. I'd love to see your Fitbit numbers uh, of how many flights you make. Uh, Two thousand steps <laughs> a day. How many steps? We, I'm, I'm average around 15,000 a day. 
Nice. I don't know if you remember that at 88th Street, I had the guy Nate working for me from AEA, and he was an early adapter in 2012 of Fitbit. So he just got one. He's all excited, big soccer guy. And uh, I think one day at 88th Street, he covered 77 flights of stairs going from those basement all the way up. And you know how we had that staircase, the temporary staircase. He was like, I did 77 flights today. You know how crazy that is? I was like, yeah, it's a lot of work to work here. <laughs> all right. I think, I think I'm done I with think my I want to remind of one, of one more uh one more piece of advice he had from last night, and that was uh, getting a blower door to have on site all the time to do the the air guided ear sealing instead of paying for a third party every time. Did you mention that yet? No, but I I agree. I I, I don't know what the cost at that that time. I think we purchased it. I think it was eighteen hundred. But if you hire a third party, I think they charge anywhere from four to five hundred, depending. You pay for it four times if they come out. So if you're constantly testing at every aspect, it pays for itself. So if you're going to do more than more passive house, you purchase the blower door at the beginning, you own it, you are trained at a Kevin or another air sale course, and you just constantly do it and it pays for itself. So you can test every week, keep the data. So you're not waiting. It, it, it will work. It definitely work. I agree. One, one thing to point out too is, uh, you can find them on eBay. They're, they're sold used throughout the country. Most of my, some of my equipment I bought used from people who went out of business as home performance contractors or whatever it is. So you can get a good deal out there. And then one thing I suggested to my local New York passive house chapter a while ago, and it just never got off the ground was what a lot in California, the utilities sponsor these lending libraries, whereas a contractor or homeowner, you can borrow tools like a, like a tool shed or so. So if you, if you're involved in one of these, uh, you know, passive house groups, a group of people can put together some money, start a tool shed, and then that organization has has a, a blower door that you can borrow or rent and then share it um, uh, would be great too, As because not everyone has a project going on at the same time. So uh, uh, just something to think about those little 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 things could help contractors smart. I always said smart tools in the hands of smart people equal progress. And that's what kind of the technology part of this uh, Tech Tuesday is really about. So, um, uh, and blow a door testing is so easy. A knucklehead fireman can do it. Uh, I always laugh when, when, when I see like architects and engineers be like, oh, that's a blow a door. I don't know how to use it. It's like, calm down. It's just a, a fan and a, and a pressure gauge. We can get this down. I was 19 when I first started using it. And uh, it's, 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 it's pretty easy to teach somebody, so but it's a great tool and it has to be practical smoke sticks and touching and feeling the air leakage is really where you learn how the air barriers are going in and where the mistakes are. Luis, you got, you, you guys had uh, the building type, John Mitchell and Ed Mays blow a door for a while, right? Yeah, we had it, we had it running for a couple of days. Um, um, the first try, you know, we had a few um, leakage, so we just had it on and we spent a whole day just walking the job site, feeling for air, smoke sticks, and just patching up every area that we found. So um, that was very helpful. And and from you know, I, I'm one of the the I took I took place. I helped try and find those. I did the blow a door test at 88th Street, and then we tried to find all those leaks. And it was true group effort. Um, uh, everyone from the electrician to the plumber to Cliff to, to, to the site super, everyone was looking for leaks. We had the, 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 the subcontractor, Sam, had his nose out. He was finding leaks. Um, uh, it was great. And, uh, and even, even the plaster guy, you remember the plaster guy? He was wow. very Tad, he was great. He was like this. He made, he was an organic farmer. And during the winters, he made custom plaster uh, pieces that were replicas of historic uh, things, real craftsmen. And he's sometimes he'd walk around with me for 20 minutes finding leaks. I'm like, don't you got something to do? He's like, no, but this is interesting. This is science. So I'm like, this guy was the best. Uh, but my tangent was kind of like, everyone's got to find the leaks, have a little bit of buy in. And, uh, and it, it, it really makes, it, it improved our process of building passive house because we spent the time and the, the pain of trying to find those leaks and knowing like, Oh, once that drywall goes up and the finish happens, you don't get another chance to fix that. And then you have to undo somebody's work. Nothing takes the life out of a, out of like somebody when you have to redo work, it's almost like their soul is coming off the wall and their efforts are being untaken. And it's oh, just, you see people around and when you start undoing work on a construction site, the morale goes such, and then daycare starts, right? Cliff, you have to have meetings, put the feet up. You have to get a meeting and there's a change order and 
<laughs> yes, change expensive. orders. Don't talk about them, right? Don't uh, those don't happen. All right. So uh, let's kick it off to Sean. Do we have a question queue? Who do we got? Run through that ball to me, Kevin. So Whoa. I just want to say there's a lot Thank of you. questions coming in off of the chat. Sean, did you want to say anything about the presentations or? No, it's fantastic. And again, it's really nice to have uh, the view, you know, talking about high performance buildings and festivals from the site super. So again, Cliff and Louis, Louis, sorry, Louise, thanks for your insight. And, uh, and again, I mean, I had a construction company for a while on the glorified babysitter role. I get it. And uh, you guys are doing a great job. And, and I think, you know, that the best part is, is, is not having to manage job sites, but training and teaching and mentoring people how to do this. And, and that changes the culture of the job site. It's not just about ticking things off, but also like doing things in the right order for the success. And the success is, is a little different now that you're trying to improve on the air barrier. And so good stuff, appreciate it, great insights. Well, and you know, putting up with the guys who don't wanna learn new tricks and then putting up with people like me on the site who get so excited about the blower door, Kevin, that I know it, you know, you get both extremes going there and, it, and it's tough. So I take my hats off to the site supers. They have to deal with everybody. Um, so one of the first questions we had coming in when Luis was still presenting was from Hans in Toronto. Hans, are you still there? And would you like to ask your question? Yeah, it's actually a Proclima related question <laughs> about Viscon. Um, I saw that it was applied um, like in patches. And so I was actually wondering if it can be applied over the entire area, if that makes any sense. Well, we um, actually use um, white Viscon and black Viscon. Um, so that's what you saw, the white Viscon, and then some of the areas where um, we didn't have black, at, we didn't have white at the time. So we just opted in and used the black okay. because that's just what was available. Um, but you applied it over the entire, the entire inside wall or? Correct, uh, over all the brick wall, yeah. The cool. entire all four walls can that be sprayed or is that rolled on or uh, well we first we went on we did a coat of spray on all the walls and then we went back and we rolled it on the wall so we applied it two to three times depending on on the um how the wall was taking it okay. um we typically like using the white viscon instead of the black just because with the white viscon you could um, see visually if you have any um, small holes. We tried using the white as much as we can, um, but um, in some areas, you know, we just had to use the black just because that was available and, you know, we um, needed to get the job done at that time. So, yeah. cool. That's awesome. I, I love the white Viscon. I mean, uh, I've been fighting the battle on two projects with the uh, with the with the blue to black version, and it's great to see the blue to black dry. But uh, with our poor substrates of these brownstones, um, uh, like Luis, one of the pictures that you showed was the uh, the architecture, the, the engineered strapping that went on on the front, and then there was a bunch of different substrates from brick to plaster to the front wall to the side wall. Substrates are a nightmare on these brownstone projects. So anything you can do to uh, to, 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 to find the small little pinholes because our largest surface areas in these projects, seven, 8,000 square feet is party wall, you know, and it's getting that, it's getting that air barrier on early and fast. Cause once it's on, it starts getting covered with, with framing and, and HVAC and mechanical. It's, it's, it's a good process. It's, it's, it's a good product. I like the white personally, just because it's easier to find the holes and it makes a, a better working environment. Like you feel a little like, Right, or if it's dark and it's dingy, it's tough to, uh, you know, it's tough to do the temporary lighting and get get good uh, good lighting for everyone to work, but also to for everything else like that. Hans, right. did we answer? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot. Thanks. No Great presentation too, Luis. Thanks, Hans. We also have another question for Luis uh, from Jason Wen. Jason Wen, are you still with us? Uh, yes, I am. Um, question for both Cliff and Luis. Uh, Working from the consultant side, how can we make drawings better so that you can understand what's going on, what we want to be our air barrier, what we want to be our moisture barrier, uh, so that that way, just doing your your tender your tender documents and uh, in your first drawing set, uh, review, uh, there's just a way more clarity on what we want to see. Well, and, uh, well, I think I have to say again, I'm not trying to toot anybody horn. I think I had clear and direct drawings from the Bax Ingrid team. It made it a lot easier 
um, for me. Um, more elevations is always helpful. More, you know, more detail is. I didn't have an issue at that aspect of it, um, so I might be kind of biased. Um, they did a great job of giving me good detail, um, but you definitely uh, elevation is always great. Um, some things are kind of difficult to actually draw it because it's in the field and you kind of got to work it out in the field. So you may give us the best drawings, but the field doesn't call for it. So we have to kind of modify what you give us. So you know, better elevation, but I worked with a team that gave me some amazing drawings. I didn't have an issue at that aspect. Um, it's mostly what's in the field and what you cannot see and what you probably can't draw up and what we have to do on the fly is where we have most of the issues. So hopefully that may answer your question too. Yeah, I think Cliff hit it right on. It's, it's drawings that I had was were pretty great too. Um, they were drawn by um same architect, Beck Stingui, and they had um, building type as their consultant and all the drawings were pretty good. Um, again, the only issues we ran into was when it, we had to, um, couldn't go by the drawings because of the field condition and uh, you know, we just had to come up with something on the field. But other than that, um, the drawings were pretty good. I don't have anything else to add to that. Jason, uh, just to add something that I, I know from the training process is uh, describing drawings in the two-dimensional world to tradespeople is a little subjective, but when you present them in a three-dimensional way, either isometric or, or uh, you know, from the manufacturers and they're fully color-coded and you can see the layers, that's really helpful. And then one thing that we do on site as just like a kind of like a brainstorming session to see how can we do this better as a group is the mock-up. The mock-up is, is a great learning process. The first run, the first window, the first corner, the first area there, very helpful. And then one thing I find that me as an air sealing contractor is uh, getting the structural drawings interlaid into the, into the architectural set as early as possible. So then we can, we can figure out what the, what they are, you know, um, uh, that really is very helpful. And then uh, site meetings is where the magic happens. So I have all the vested parties at the table, give, get, you give me a wall, I'll give you an air barrier. I give you an air barrier, you do the framing. You do the framing, I'll put up the Intello. You give me the Intello, I'll put, a, I'll put in the insulation. You know, it's that give, get relationship that pushes a schedule really quick, so. I pre Actually, appreciate the insight. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, and Ke Kevin, that was actually a really good uh, segue to a next question, unless you weren't finished answering that one, Luis. Did I interrupt you? I did want to just kind of kind of do a follow up. Um, and and it's good to hear that the drawings that you work with on your passive house jobs are great. But but I, when I think when I I work with tons of code minimum projects, t tons tons where there aren't floor door tests, but the code still still calls for a continuous air barrier anyways. So. Um, so really, there's to, to me, there's no reason why these passive house processes of mock-ups, uh, detailing, uh, like red line, blue line, can't be transferred to a code minimum project. And and um, from Louise and Cliff's perspective, like how what has Bax Ingui done above and beyond your say your other code minimum projects in terms of their their processes and drawings that helped you achieve the goals? Go first, Louise. Um, let me see that last. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, uh. Again, I'm kind of biased. I have an amazing team. So I'm trying to think of what they could have done. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I, I don't think I can answer that question. I didn't come across those issues. I don't want to give you a false information that I didn't have. It was difficult that I didn't have those. Um, damn but it, Mike. Because you guys don't work on code minimum projects. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm saying, I don't think so. We like, don't have, yeah. I don't think Lewis, you're working on it. Our, our project doesn't require that, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not familiar with those kind of projects. But, um, I think Kevin did it right on where he said that, um, you know, you um, bring in the um, structural drawings and you do passive details with them and make sure that your, your structural drawings and your um, your architecturals are, are, are both um, thought, thought, you know, are both um, reviewed and you on both of them thought about how each connection is going to be made and how your um, passive details, your air barrier is um, going to happen between them, you know? 
All right, thank you. Yeah, it took up a lot of time, uh, but uh, yeah, let's hope let's hope uh, code minimum gets better as well to catch up to passive house. The difference between code minimum and passive house is the effort put into the drawings up front and the commitment of the team to hit the project goals. Um, uh, if you read the code minimum specs, it says continuous air barrier. The only way you make an air barrier continuous is by buy-in, accountability, planning, and 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 making sure that everyone has a vested interest. Um, uh, and and I, I think we can get code buildings to hit passive house. It's just uh, we're getting there. So um, uh, it should be next. A blow door test should be passed. Three air changes per hour is is is. There's not a lot of work between three air changes per hour and one air change per hour. Um, uh, most likely it's the windows and some of the other penetrations that you make. But uh, can can I uh, jump the queue? Uh, Read question, and I just wanted to refer him to uh, the prep work on on the, the the brick masonry of doing a fluid applied air barrier. Uh, we did a Tech Tuesday with the Viscon that was pretty good. You can find that in the YouTube page. And that goes over very in detail with 475 with Matt and Aaron uh, of what it took to get that to uh, to, to the next level. Um, uh, and that was our process of prepping the wall. So removing the plaster, brushing it down, getting it over there. Um, uh, so there's a lot of work that goes into it. And then to touch on another question that I saw about lime plaster, uh, general rule of thumb is if you don't, in these brownstone projects, if you don't need to remove the plaster for inches, leave it on the wall if it's in good condition. Uh, and then if we can find the trade from other parts of, 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 from Boston or other area that do plaster, brown coat, scratch coat, finish coat, and they price it at an affordable way, we can do plaster. It's just, I don't have that skill and know anyone who has that skill, uh, but you're touching the wall almost four to five times. And what we find is that with the Viscon and the fluid applied air barriers, we like to only touch the wall two or three times um, uh, if we can, you know, but, uh, you know, prep, prep, spray, spray again, touch up, you know, that should be the end of the air barrier. Whereas if you're doing the plaster, you know, it's a, there's a lot of mixing and everything. So hopefully it'll be there. I think right. Michael Ingwe wanted to answer a little bit of that question that was hanging out there. Michael, is that true? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, I have two things. One, I'll talk about the drawings, but then I'll talk about these two guys. Um, so the drawings, um, I mean, uh, even even our sets uh, can always be better, but uh, the one thing that we're, and, and, and that the team at the office really, I mean, they really dive in and honestly, they, they meet with Kevin and John and all of them and the contractors very early. We do not wait to bid out our projects until our CD sets are done. We budget our projects after schematic design is completed and we do our CD sets with our contractors in mind. So uh, one of the reasons why they're that complete is we work in almost a design build way. So uh, although I would love to take all the credit, it, it, it goes back to them as well. It's one of the reasons they're so confident with the sets um, when we're looking at them. Uh, that's one. Number two, code minimum uh, is, a, is a great term. And hopefully we won't talk about passive house anymore because the code will come up to passive house because all it is is just better details and better ways of sealing something and better ways of installing something. And you have to ask yourself the question, why wouldn't you do that when you know that it's possible and that if you could do it enough and if the whole industry knows you can do it and the whole industry learns how to do it, it doesn't cost more, which I think was one of the original points. And what Backstate is doing, and I know a whole bunch of other offices are doing the same thing. I know a whole bunch of the um, consultants are doing the same thing is we're trying to create repeatable details so that they can be shared broadly and it can be done in all sorts of houses. There's just no reason why that can't happen. I know the accelerator is one of the things that we'll be working on in a little while, better ways of kind of sharing those details. But there's a lot of people putting those details out there so that it can be done. But then I'll also talk about Luis and Cliff because uh, in terms of site supers, <clears throat> they have a thirst for knowledge and they, they want to learn and they want to do it better. And they're critically thinking about everything they're doing. Uh, I think Luis about that, that one day where you were going around with the smokesticks and we had already kind of hit the number and you're still looking for all the holes and where you could do it better. And, you know, there was no stopping you. You're like, you guys were going to look for all the holes. And you're like, you know, you had the blower door. It was there. You were still going to look for it. And when you have that attitude as a site super, like anything else in the universe, everyone who's around you has that attitude. It's infectious. Uh, everyone wants to be like you. Everyone wants to have that same 
um, attitude. And, um, and that's what makes, I mean, besides skill set and being able to build anything, uh, that, that's one of the skill sets that I think sets uh, the, the two of you apart. I, I think it, it makes a huge difference. And um, it's hard to value that. It's hard to quantify it. But it's, uh, it's one of the things that makes a big difference. All right. Thanks, Mike. I think we should, uh, we should do, if you, guys, if you guys want to roll with it, your mentors, and then we'll kick it to Zach, all right? So, uh, Luis, since you went first, we'll kick it to you. As a, as a shout out to your mentors, if you don't mind. I, uh, I, 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 I Well, you could say, them. Kevin, if you want, Luis. You could say, don't be scared. <laughs> He's my mentor, too. I haven't paid him yet. I haven't paid him yet. Cliff, you got a mentor? Yeah, can I get him? He's right here with me. Get you know him. Mind? Go get him. He's going to be embarrassed. <laughs> But this is my son, Hunter Chambers, and he's my mentor because he teaches me every day to be a better person and teaches me how to learn everything. He's have gotten me to read more. He has beaten me in chess. Even I taught him, he's getting better than me. So I, I am blessed to have him as my mentor. And I love you. Get out of here. I'm going to embarrass now. Thanks, Cliff. It's heartwarming. Thank you. You're welcome. Gorgeous, Cliff. Beautiful. You're welcome. I think you just presented my favorite mentor. <laughs> if that's not the reason to do what we're doing, what is? is. Yes, it is. Thank you so much for that, Cliff. You're welcome. You ever bring what? him on the site with you? He came, uh, you know, honestly, no, the last two jobs that he has, but he's getting, he's a teenager now, so he's embarrassed by me. <laughs> and he is stuck in a room. And I always said, I have two things. He is going to be a genius or he's going to be the Unabomber because I don't know what he's doing. Right now. <laughs> Two options, really, really smart or he's going to be in the news somewhere because I got to get my back room. I don't know what's going on. Anymore. Congratulations. You have a teenager. Yes, I am with you. I have one too. <laughs> yeah, I have no clue what's going on in there. So yeah. Nice job, Cliff. <laughs> one, one quick quote I like to throw in there is when, when we're construction guys, we're going on site, you know, out there we strap on our boots for a reason it's to provide for our family make them proud and uh the thing about craftsmanship and professionalism is we don't strap those boots on and leave those people at home to embarrass them and not do the best job we can so when people are on site they want they don't want to make mistakes they want to do it right they want to do it to the best they want to do work that they can point to that building and show their kids a hundred years from now and be like, I, I worked on that building. It's still there. It was a great performing building. That was one of the first passive house projects that ever started. You know, me and Cliff will walk by there in our walkers when we're older and be like, Hey, remember that project Cliff? Yeah. Let's go to Central Park. Look at the birds. So uh, thank you guys on that note and bad joke. I'll kick it off to, uh, to Zach, please. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, none of this work that we do at the Accelerator would happen if it weren't for the support of our, of our, our sponsors. So I want to give a big shout out to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Backstink We Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and de Dehumidification, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, RDH Building Science, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Our stakeholder partner is NYSERDA, and our patron sponsors are BR Plus A Consulting Engineers, Brennan Brennan Air Tight Insulation and Air Tightness, Inotech Windows and Doors, and US Engineered Wood T Stud. I also want to give a special uh, shout out to 475 High Performance Building Supply this week for being our sponsor of the week. Thank you to 475. Uh, we have a great podcast episode uh, um, live now with Claire Perry of Hip V Hype. She is one of the founders of the Australian Passive House Association, and she has a great conversation with Matthew Cutler Welsh about that history and uh, and her role as uh, one of the pioneers of a uh, passive house down under. So please check that out. Uh, tomorrow, we have a great presentation by In Cho. She'll be presenting about her project in Grand Mercy Park. Uh, the, it's a PHI uh, certified retrofit of a townhouse. Uh, we, just, we just saw the presentation uh, earlier today, and it's fantastic. Join us tomorrow, please. Next, oh, and then on Thursday, we have a very special event. We, it's a, the return of our Passive House Component Spotlights. And this one will, we, will be with 475. It will... Uh, 
features Nick Shaw, who will be presenting about 475 materials and application for smart enclosure design. Again, these are uh, these events are designed as a very interactive experience. So we'll get a fast paced uh, presentation from Nick at followed by Q&A, lively Q&A. So this is a chance to bring your questions uh, to 475 and to Nick. Next week, Construction Tech will feature Scott Farbman, uh, um, a building performance analyst. And he'll be talking about the engineering behind the first FIAS rehab in Chicago. And uh, then the Passive House Happy Hour will feature our, our very own Shan Shannon Pendleton, as well as one of our guest co-hosts of the Passive House podcast, Ilka Cassidy and Angela Iraldi. So it should be a great uh, happy hour. And I think that's it. It is. Thanks, everyone.